everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith, and it, man, am I ever excited today to start the solo playthrough of Psy. This is a, this has been a long time coming. I know you guys, a lot of you have been waiting for this for quite some time, and I've been preparing for it, as well as acquiring all of the special tokens and coins and all that stuff to kind of make the playthrough the best it can be. Uh, I didn't actually back Scythe on uh, Kickstarter, so I basically had to go hunt around for every individual upgrade separately. I don't have them all, but the game is, it's just one of the games I truly love, and I really want to show you guys how the solo play works and just how much fun it can be. So we thought, or at least I thought, it would be fun to do two different factions against myself. And I am Canadian, so I'm gonna start way up in the northern coldest region of the board, and we're gonna work our way down as we battle likely towards the factory in order to get some wonderful factory cards. So without further ado, let's begin the playthrough. All right, so because I am the player, or the only human player in the game, I get to start first. So the very first thing I want to do is I really want to get some units moving. So I actually have some workers head out, and normally, at the beginning of the game, you can't cross rivers because you need to actually upgrade or potentially go after river walks. So I'd have to create a mech in order to give myself abilities to do different things like get across rivers and things like that. Of course, the automa can't do it until it hits a certain point on its track. So once it gets past this uh, little wave here with the cross through it, then it can start crossing through rivers. The really cool thing about these, this northern faction is that it basically has this swim ability up here. It says your workers may move across rivers. So it says workers, meaning only the wooden workers like these guys, can actually just hop across water, which is really useful. However, it doesn't allow me to take my character and go running over here to grab a bunch of stuff. I'm going to have to actually open up something like Riverwalk in order to get those guys out of there. But for now, I could use a move action, hypothetically, to get these workers over to some of these other areas in order to potentially gain more workers. Now, when I say that, there's these little worker icons, and every single hex has a resource that you can acquire when you actually produce or... Um, essentially try to produce on a particular location. So in order to get more workers, I'd have to get some workers there and then do a produce action. So to get there, I'm gonna actually go ahead and do a move action. So I'm gonna use my large action token here and we're gonna go ahead and do a move action. So you start at the very top. We're able to move two units, two or one space each. That's why they're divided up into two separate boxes. So you can only touch two of two units and then uh, move them each one space. So what I could do is I can actually take this unit and move it here and take this unit and move it here and I've got units in either of the uh, spots to actually gain more workers in the future positions me well. Okay, so after I take the top action, you take a quick look at the bottom action to determine if you can do that. So in this one, it says that we could pay two oil in order to upgrade. Now, upgrading is pretty cool, but we do not have that resource just yet. So because we don't have it, we can't use it. So that's going to end my turn. Another thing to note is that you'll notice one of my workers ended up on a hex here with one of these encounter tokens. However, this cannot be encountered unless my character is in that location. So I don't get to reveal this and I don't get to go over here and grab an encounter in order to resolve it until I get my character into that position. And for now, my character can't do that because my character cannot cross rivers. All right, so we're gonna go ahead now and we're going to pull the very first Automa card for our yellow faction. So we're gonna go right here, grab this Automa card off the top of the deck and see what we get. So we have a couple commands at the top and you typically go through this card row by row. So you take a look at the top section then you go to that second line and then the third line and you're just gonna follow it all the way through. So the very first one here has two symbols with a dash in between it or a slash. And uh, there's basically two things that this, this uh, character or this uh, Automa unit can do. In this particular case, this symbol on the far left of that slash is an encounter factory symbol. And so that one is going to be us selecting our Automa character for that particular, because that's the only one that can actually encounter tokens like this, the encounter tokens, or go to a factory is the character only. The workers, uh, yeah, they can progress through the map, but they can't actually interact with the encounter tokens or the factory. So in this particular case, with that symbol, we're going to be choosing to do that one first. And how this typically works is you basically, and oh, actually it always works, is if you can do the one side of the slash, then that's all you'll do for that row, and then you move to the next row. The reason it's even giving you two options on the top rows in case the first one can't be done. But we can do this first one, and I'll show you how that's going to work. So the first thing is we select the Automa character. We already talked about the fact this is the only character that can do this type of thing. We need to find valid hexes from here, and valid hexes are any in the neighborhood of any Automa unit. So technically in the neighborhood basically means anything around a hex that has a current Automa unit in it. So really the only available hex right now is this one because we're not allowed to cross rivers yet. 
This will dictate when we're able to do so. When this cube eventually gets down the track and comes off of the little river to, um, swirl there with the cross through it or the slash through it, then they'll be able to cross rivers. So until then, they're stuck on their uh, little kind of homeland base. And actually, this is the home base itself, but they're stuck on these three hexes right here. So the only place that this individual can actually move is just right here. Now you'll also notice that I moved one unit two spaces and movement with the autumn is much different than the human player. So when I move, I have to follow strict rules that only allow me to move one character per space, at least until other abilities might generate higher movement values. Basically the autumn has got some really crazy technology that essentially allows you to basically warp anywhere on the map as long as you're within a neighboring hex. And neighboring hexes I talked about are kind of anything surrounding a particular hex. And then of course, the, the decision basically comes down to how many neighboring hexes are around them is where you place them. In this case, it's very simple because there's only one. We'll get into the more of the complex stuff uh, when the options open up when we find ourselves in the middle here, but this is as far as I can go and I can teleport. So you're thinking about it in a different light than I would when I'm doing my human character. I'm just teleporting this automa character there. The next thing that's going to happen is, once you've got your character in this particular location, you'll notice there is an encounter token in here. Now the Ottoman handles these differently. Normally if I landed in them, I'd actually pull an, a, like an actual encounter, I would go through it, I may gain something, and typically it's something good. What the uh, Automa is going to do is basically land in here and it's going to destroy that particular token. So it's kind of going around the board looking to knock out as many of them as possible so that I can't basically use them to my advantage. Uh, obviously getting all the way down here from up there is quite a task in itself, but it's going to kind of eat up all of those encounter tokens around here. And they don't count for any points, they're just basically destroying them as they go through. So. We picked up all the encounter tokens that are here, and then at this at this point, it would either be doing what we just did, which is destroying an encounter token, or potentially having uh, having our character land on the factory. That's really what this symbol in the top left here does. So we've done that top row, so that's great. The next thing that's going to happen is this one. They're going to gain actually three power. So we're going to come to the power track, and yellow is going to jump one, two, three. So they're all the way up to eight, which makes them a little menacing. And then we're gonna, they're actually going to go ahead and gain some money, which is straight up points for them really at the end of the game. So that's that. They're also down here going to go ahead with an enlist. So the enlist is a little bit different and I'll explain that right now. All right, so we're going to talk really quickly about the third row of the Automa card here, which is this one right here. It has an enlist symbol. And basically, if I've recruited the individual that matches that particular icon, then I get to go ahead and gain that, that ability. So in this case, I would actually gain a gold if I had enlisted that or recruited that individual. So I come down here to this board, and this right here is where it is. So in some point in the future, if I enlist or choose to enlist, and I actually have this revealed like that, and this comes up again, I would actually go ahead and gain a coin. So there is an advantage to that, and what that's doing is automating how that would work with a multiplayer game, where uh, one of your enemies basically does a particular action, and you gain a benefit from it. So this is never going to, this third row is never going to benefit the actual Automa, it's always gonna be a benefit for you, but you only get it if you actually have the matching corresponding recruit in use. So in this case, we don't get it. Now, the next thing we're going to do on the card to finish it off, you never want to forget this, is that center icon in the middle shows a star. Sometimes this will be enabled and other times it's disabled. If it's enabled, you're moving your star tracker cube one over. If it's disabled, you're not. So simply put, uh, this is actually not going to progress this particular faction's automa any faster across the track meaning that it's not any closer to stars, it's also not any closer to getting across rivers, which is fantastic. So that's pretty much it, and we have finished the first Automa card. All right, so we're just gonna sum up really quick the entire card we went through. So at the very, very top, it's the Automa's actions. The second row down is when the Automa gains stuff, or that particular faction that's being automated gains things, and what they gain. And the last one is the recruitment bonus. And then, of course, the middle is the star tracker movement, whether it happens or doesn't happen. That is the major parts of this card. There's some other stuff that will come to play when things flip over, things get a little more difficult, and there's obviously combat here on the sides. Different things to talk about when we run into them, but for right now, that's what's most important. So at this point now, we're going to move over to the white faction. All right, here we go. Let's uh, flip the first card for the white faction and see what we get. So we have a very similar action to what we had with the other one. So again, we're going to be able to perform this first one, which is the factory or encounter card uh, action. So we're going to go ahead and do that. We know that we're going to be selecting the character and moving it to a valid hex. The only valid hex possible is this one. So this character is going to move to here. It's going to suck up this encounter token and it is now gone off the board. 
And that's pretty much it. Then we move to the gaining section here. You'll notice it's a little different than the last card, even though they had the same action up top. We're going to be gaining a worker. So a worker will be taken from the supply, and this drops on the home base. And then we're going to come over here, we're going to take a look, and we actually gain a combat card. So we're going to go ahead and gain one combat card, which we do not look at, and add to the stack. So this actual faction now has four combat cards total, because it started with three and just gained one. So that's pretty powerful. Um, and then down below, another enlisting or recruitment bonus, if I happen to have that particular card unlocked on my mat, I would get that, or I gain a card, I should say, and I don't in this case. But what will happen now is the Star Tracker will actually move for the White Faction. So they're actually getting closer to being able to cross water, which is probably not a good thing, seeing as I am the closest to the White Faction rather than the yellow. So I'm really hoping that that starts to slow down soon. All right, so it's back to me and now I can make my mind up as to what action I want to do next. So I'm really thinking about doing the produce action. So how this works is we're gonna take the action marker, drop it in this area, and we're gonna start at the very, very top. So the first thing I'm gonna do is produce on two different spaces. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now. So we're gonna actually gonna go ahead and take two of these workers away and you'll wonder why that is in a second. I'll also explain what the symbol that I just revealed means for later turns. But basically I'm taking two workers because I'm producing on two different spaces. So what you have to do is look at each of these spaces individually. So this one right here, we'll start and choose this one to produce on. You gain whatever resource is noted in the hex. So in this case, that is a worker. And you gain however many of those workers you have in there in workers as well. So if I happen to have two workers in here, I gain two. I have one, so I'm only gonna gain one. So an additional worker is placed in here and now I have two. So you can see how this thing starts to bolster pretty quick. And now over here, I have two. So I have a total of four now because I produced on two different hexes. So that's what I wanted to do with this. You'll also notice that a symbol was revealed and what that's gonna mean is if I choose to produce in the future, I'm gonna be able to do again two different hexes and produce on them, but I will actually have to pay a power in order to do so. So it's becoming more expensive to bring more people out. So I don't take that penalty when I first do it or it's first revealed, but going forward, I'm gonna to have to start paying that. So we're gonna move down to the bottom section of this to see if we can do this. This is the enlist action that would be so valuable based on how many enlist bonuses we've had with the faction so far. If I was able to actually spend three food, then I'd be able to enlist and hopefully start making some bonus there, but I don't have food yet. We're gonna have to start working on that very soon. And you'll notice just based on where I'm, I'm sitting here, food is over here, over here, and even over here. So that's actually quite far away. I'm very close to workers. I'm very close to, close to steel, wood, and oil, but uh, the food is kind of eluding me. It's a little further away. I'm gonna have to work towards finding that or getting my workers there. Moving right along, we're gonna do the yellow faction next. So we're gonna grab the automatic card here and see what happens. So the very first thing we've got is a faction specific action in brackets. So if we are that particular faction, which we are not, that faction actually is way up here and we're currently not using that faction. We would then use this action and then not this other one. We are not that faction, so we will do the opposite side of this particular row for actions for the Automa, and that's gonna be a movement of a worker meeple. So we're gonna go ahead and try to figure out which one's valid. So there's a way in which we do this, a way in which we narrow down which worker is valid. So it comes down to the move worker action is what it's called. So it's closest to the Automa base. So as of right now, technically, we have two workers that are right beside the home base. The tiebreaker is in reading order. So reading order is basically going from left to right all along the board, all the way down to the bottom. So the first one we would run into is this one before we ran into this one. So because of that, this is going to be the chosen worker that ends up getting moved. In terms of valid hexes, um, it's gonna be, these are just determining which hexes are valid. So it could be in the, bring, uh, in the neighborhood of any Automa unit or in the neighborhood of an Automa's base, which this is, that's valid. There could be no enemy units there and there could be no Automa worker um, other than the one selected, of course. So we've got this one here, so we're good. So now we're gonna choose that particular worker by picking it up. We're gonna choose a valid destination hex and that's either gonna be any valid hex in the neighborhood of the most Automa units. So as of right now, the most Automa units would just be single one, which would just be right here. Really, it's gonna end up heading up this way. And the reason that we figured that out is because we also can't be in the neighborhood of any enemy combat units. Well, right now there isn't any on the board. The tiebreaker, when there's more than one option, technically we could go anywhere out here because we're in the neighborhood of many different 
um, hexes that are valid around this particular character. But to know which one is the most valid, the first tie breaker is closest to the factory. So that would actually be this one right here, as it's only two away from the factory. Although technically this one is as well, only two away. So we technically have two to choose from there. So in that particular case, then it would come down to reading order and reading order would have us going left to right across these rows. So it would in fact be right here. So this worker will jump across the water. Now this is where things break quickly. I wanted to show you guys kind of how we would go about doing this because we can't do it yet. There is a river here. So this would be what we would be able to do if we actually had the river walk ability here with the yellow faction and we currently aren't out of that row yet so we can't make this move which means we can't for the first time do any of the actions on the top row of that ottoman card and we move right along so let's make sure we're actually looking at the correct card because that actually was the other card this is the one we're talking about right now. So we can't do the top row of this particular card. So we'll go to the second row and you'll see there's another faction uh, action or ability that can basically be taking place. We won't talk about it right now because we can't do it because that's not the faction we are. We are not that symbol's faction, which means we're not this one right here. It's not in play. So we'll move along to the next thing of what the Automa would gain, and that's gonna be a worker. So a worker is gonna come out for the faction into the home base, as it always does. For us, when we actually gain workers, it goes basically like, as you guys saw, well, it has to go into the same area where those uh, resources are being gathered or taken. It has to basically be in a worker's area, whereas with the Automa, the workers that come out go into the home base right away. So we've done that, and we also gain one coin for this faction. So this faction is now up to seven, which again, in turn, is victory points. And we have an enlist bonus. We would get lucky and get that if we actually had it unlocked on our side, but we don't. So that's going to end off the yellow faction's turn. One last thing I want to correct real quick is the star in the middle of this card, which determines that we have to move this star tracker one space to the right. And now we have finished the yellow faction's turn. So moving right along, we're going to move into the white faction's turn. We're going to pull the automa card for the white faction. And we've got a bunch of things on the top row here for action. So the very, very first one is a, uh, you can see there's an X through a gear there. That would mean that if we were playing the automata, which is the easy version of this Star Tracker card. We're playing normal. If it was the Automata across the top here and we're playing easy, we would actually skip this entire turn for the Automa. But because we're playing it on normal, we do not skip, so we're gonna continue on. The next one's in brackets, and it all has to do with being part of a particular faction, which happens to be this faction right here, because that symbol shows up. And we are not that faction, so we don't take that action. So we move to the next one, which is, and again, if we ever took the faction action, you don't take the one next to it either. You just do the faction action and you move along down the down through the rows. So we're gonna go all the way to the end because we're not that faction. We're gonna be a, a doing a movement of a meeple very similar to what we did over here with the other one. So let's go ahead and do that. So again, over here with this particular grouping, we have quite a few different uh, workers involved. We have one on the home base, we have two right here. All right, in order to do the move action of right now, we're gonna have to determine which individual is valid. So right now we determine that by selecting the Ottoman worker that's closest to the Ottoman's home base. So that's gonna be this worker right here. And we're gonna go ahead, pick this worker up, and we're gonna determine where it should go. Now, what's restricting us from actually completing this action is the fact we still have not gotten past the river phase for this faction. We need to get all the way, the tracker needs to be past those river symbols with the cross to them over here in order for us to be able to cross the river, which essentially means that this action that I wanna take right now can't happen. So I cannot actually do this action because there's nowhere where I can bring that worker that isn't crossing a river at this point, and you don't stack workers in the same spots. As, uh, as other workers. So I am kind of stuck. My hands are tied with this particular Automa at the moment. So we're actually not gonna be going ahead with the uh, movement section of that particular card. So the top section doesn't happen at all. What will happen though is this uh, faction is gonna bring a new worker by gaining it from the second row. And it's also gonna go into the home base. And they're also gonna gain themselves a coin. So we're gonna be grabbing a coin from the supply and giving it to the Automa. And there's an enlist bonus. So if we happen to have popularity, uh, recruited 
then we would actually gain uh, some uh, popularity at the moment if that was the case, but we do not. And we probably do need to enlist or at least start aiming for that to try to get some of those bonuses, which would be super nice going forward. And that is going to conclude, except for the movement of the star tracker. So we don't want to forget about that star. So we are going to move this down to here. And we can see that the white faction currently is just one step ahead from the yellow in terms of being able to cross over rivers. Once that happens, things are going to get very, very interesting. And just like that, we're swinging all the way around to my turn. So I'm going to go ahead and we're going to choose the... Well, let's go ahead and do this action here. This is the trade action. So we're going to pay one coin for my supply of six. I'm going to use one coin to pay for this, giving me... Uh, I'm able to basically take two resources of any type I'd like, or I could gain a popularity. I'm going to choose the resources, and I'm going to go after actually the uh, oil, because I really want to try to upgrade it next turn. So we're going to grab two things of oil from the reserve here, and I'm just going to place them on a space with a worker. So I'm going to choose to put them over here. I'll plan on using them later anyway. Actually, what I might do is put them over here, because I think these workers will end up staying put more so. So we'll do like that. And now we're going to go to the bottom action of this one, which would be paying four wood to build. Can't do that yet, uh, sadly, because I don't have the I don't have the wood, I don't have the resources. So with that being said, I think that is pretty much everything I can do for my turn. I think now is a good time to let you guys in on a little secret in terms of what my objective cards are because I haven't revealed them thus far and I thought now at this point it's a good time to start thinking about them. Now, I mean, there's strategies involved with these objectives. Of course, if you complete one of them, we can gain a star way up there on the star track. Uh, but the downside of it is if you focus too much on these objectives, they can actually kind of hurt you in your overall plan. So it's a little bit of a balance as to whether or not the objectives are en route to what you're trying to do in terms of placing six stars out uh, in order to win, or if they're going to hinder you and send you kind of off on a side trail. So I want to show you each of the two objectives that I got. I can only complete one if I choose to and if I do complete one I get a star. The first one here is called stockpile for the winter. So I basically just have to control a territory with nine or more resource tokens basically there and at least one of each type. So it's got to be pretty I got to be moving resources into one area and it's really got to be stockpiled up on it at the end of your turn. If I do that I've completed that objective. The other objective is the shore up the shore. This one is control at least five territories surrounding the same lake at the end of your turn. So this one's a lot more doable. I mean, they're both doable, of course, but just based on the fact that I do have the ability to walk freely, or I shouldn't say walk, but swim with my workers, I can control territories quite easily, get around a river. So if I control um, uh, up to five different hexes around the same river, then I can go ahead at the end of my turn and I can declare that I've got that objective complete. So that might be something to keep an eye on as we go forward, especially with the fact that at this point in time, I technically have four workers and a character, so I could make that happen. But again, you can see how going just after that objective can potentially lead you a little bit astray or maybe have you not focusing as much on building up your uh, engine, basically, in the game, which is also very important. So it's a nice, delicate balance. But now at least all of you guys understand my two options with objectives, and you can in the comments let me know which one you think and how you think I should go about doing those. All right, we're back to our yellow faction here. We're going to go ahead and pull off the top card of the deck to see what happens. Now there's a lot going on up here. We've already talked about how this works with the cross through it. Again, we're not playing Automata, which we're playing Automa. So this is not, we're not gonna be ignoring this entire card. This next one here is new. We haven't seen this one yet, but this one basically is an attack move versus a combat unit. So this isn't gonna happen either because not only, we only have one technical, uh, te technically we only have one combat unit that would be our character. Uh, a mech could also fill this role as well, but as of right now, again, we can't cross rivers and we're nowhere near anybody to, to you know, uh, actually have any type of battle with, so that's not going to happen. Uh, we'll talk more about what these actual symbols mean when we can do them, but basically this six really quick is just whether or not this particular faction or uh, combat unit has a certain power over. So we're at currently eight for the yellow faction, so we would be able to go ahead and do that action if we had a mech out or we had uh, river walk and able to get out there and do some damage. So we're going to have to skip past us, that one and do the next one, which is another attack. This one's called attack move versus a worker. So... With this one, same similar idea, you'd be doing an attack move, but we can't because we're landlocked on our continent here with the autumn with the Automa until they're off of it and or until the track star tracker moves to the second row, then we can finally move on. This is good for us because it's not coming after us. So the very last thing it could potentially do is to move 
and again we're stuck. There's no movement that can possibly be done here. So what's going to end up happening is we will just be sitting still as our workers can't progress any further or take over any other types of hexes because we have everything already covered right now. So we'll move on to the next row here which is gaining. We're going to gain two coins for this particular faction. So two more coins is going to equate to two more points of course. And then on top of that, we have an enlist here with the combat icon, so or the power icon. So if I had have had that as a recruit, uh, then we would have gained that bonus as well, and I would have gained some power. That would have been nice. But that's going to basically end the yellow faction's move. So things are obviously they they are kind of held back at the beginning because of the inability to get across water. Finally, in the round, we're going to move to the white faction and pull a card for the Automa here. Uh, again, same thing, if we were playing Automata, we would skip this particular round, but we are not, so we're going to continue on. We do not control that purple faction at all, which is this one right here, it's not in play. So we're going to skip past the brackets option for an action. The next one would be moving a mech. We don't currently have any mechs in play for the white faction over here just yet. And uh, worker movement we do have, but as of right now, everybody is taking up a spot currently so we are not going to be adding anything else uh, or moving anything else so that entire top row is basically dismissed we're going to come down here to the next row if we happen to be controlling the red faction which is this one right here or not we would go ahead and be deploying a mech so this is the first time we've seen this and really what this means is if your character which is this guy right here, will happen to not be on the game board at all, then we would deploy the character to the home base. If the character is on the on the actual map right now, then we're actually deploying a mech. So, just so you guys understand, these bracketed thing is not what we're following because we're not the red. We're gonna be following that one to the right, which is the symbol of deploying a mech. So this is gonna be the first time that a mech is coming into the game, and basically it only will deploy we'll only deploy as many mechs as we actually have available, of course. And once they're all on the game board, then there's no more left. Um, abilities underneath here are ignored, so you're not gonna take into account normally, like on my board, if I was to deploy a mech, abilities are underneath. They would boost my stats and help me out. These are just simple, I'm just simply placing them here just to have them here. And this is going to actually land in the home base, so it's gonna sit up here with the other workers, and that's gonna cause a problem because on top of all of that, there's nothing here for recruitment bonus, which is fine because I can't get a bonus for that anyway, but the star tracker does move, and now we are on the final spot, so one away from the white faction being able to move out of their con their little area of control and start crossing rivers, which is gonna be interesting because if you guys remember from very earlier on in this playthrough, there is they have the ability to teleport through. So when movement begins for mechs or, or even workers and we can cross lakes, they're gonna be able to hopscotch all the way to uh, basically the outer edge of their uh, little island or, or continent here of settlement. And uh, that's gonna cause them to start moving very quickly towards the factory in most cases. So, or potentially targeting, you know, if we have other individuals heading that way as well, whether it be me or the other uh, Automa character. So this is going to get crazy. This is exciting because we're just breaking through that just initial barrier. So we're going to go through one more round and then we're going to end the video there. So let's go right back to my turn. So let's start off with deciding what action we want to take. I think taking the move action makes the most sense for me right now. So again, I can move two units or two different units, I should say, one space each. So I want to kind of make a smart move on this one. And I think what I'm going to do is uh, this is tough actually because I I'm I have I may end up being able to take these particular workers and move them somewhere useful again I can cr I can swim across rivers as we already know so I can position them to be in a really good advantageous spot going after oil wouldn't be a bad thing because I can upgrade again so what I might do is I might actually move both of these guys up back across the river to here and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop right there. Now what we're going to do is come down to the bottom section of this and it says to pay to oil, we can go ahead and upgrade. So not only are we going to gain an upgrade, we're also going to be able to gain a coin from that. So I have to spend resources that I currently have in order to do that. So there's my two oil being spent. And at this point now we're going to get an upgrade, which basically means I can take a cube from the top row up here and then put it in the bottom row down here, making something cheaper and also bolstering or giving me a plus going forward. So let's see what this does. This would give me an extra movement, which would be really, really handy. Probably what I want to go after. Bolster would help me get my power track going up quite a bit more. This one would allow me to start gaining popularity quicker. And this one would, would be really good for production. Right now I don't have things split beyond just two hexes. So I don't think that's really high priority. I think the movement is much more useful. So I'm going to take that off the movement and I'm going to place this one down here 
on top of this row right here to block up one of the steel requirements. So now we only need three steel in order to build a mech. That's going to help me because four steel is quite a bit. I think that's the best. You could obviously uh, knock down a number of these different actions, whether you want to enlist, build, deploy, or upgrade. But the fact that the white faction already has a mech out, and I don't, I really want to get one out there so that uh, the mech can't either mess with the factory without me intervening, or it could potentially come to my area and just destroy my workers outright, which would be bad. Because remember, uh, the Automas do, do not lose any... Um, uh, popularity, which is a very normal trigger in the game when you're playing in multiplayer. Uh, if you start attacking workers, you typically lose popularity, with the Ottoman never does. So they're able to kind of do whatever they want without any kind of loss of popularity, and that's scary. So I want to protect myself there. So at this point now, we've done the top action of the move action, I should say, and then the very bottom here, we did the upgrade. So when we do the upgrade, we also gain a coin, so I don't want to forget that. So I'll take a single coin. We kind of got our coin back from Last time we spent it, I have a total of six, just so you guys are aware. And that's going to end off my turn. All right, so we're going to start with the yellow faction here, and we'll flip this over, and we've got ourselves a... Well, that's pretty straightforward. So it's going to be a movement of one of their workers. But uh, again, not going to happen based on the fact that we have uh, all of our... All of the areas here are all controlled, and uh, there's no reason to move uh, anything. Typ typically, the one that would be chosen would be the one on the base, but there's nowhere to move to and can't cross rivers yet, so that's skipped. Uh, that's sad that yellow is going to gain three power though, because that's uh, going to really push up the track. So one, two, three, so up to 11 now. That's not good. Uh, underneath that, there's no enlist bonus, but there is a star. So we are going to move this the tracker up one, getting ever so close to being able to get off of their little area right there in the bottom of the board. And now let's move over to the white faction. Okay, white faction, last turn of the video. So here we go. Uh, right off the top here, we've got a faction-specific uh, ability here for the blue faction. That's actually my faction, so that's, he's, this auto is not going to use this. The second one here is the encounter uh, one, so again, this one can't be done either because we can't encounter the factory or any encounter tokens anywhere, so we're not going to be able to do that. And we actually technically can't even do this one, which is the moving of our character. So basically, the whole top row of this particular action spread is nothing, uh, so we're not able to do any of that, but we will be gaining a worker and a power, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. So we've got another worker coming out for the white faction, just a ton here on the home base, and then over here, uh, we're going to be gaining a power. So going up to three and then we're going to come over here take a look the enlist bonus is there But we don't gain it, but the star is there. So we are finally into Open season with the white faction So going into the next video the white faction is going to be able to start teleporting their units from the back here forward And they're going to kind of start hopscotching each other uh, on their way towards encounter tokens the factory us uh, anywhere really uh, wherever the Ottoman deck really sends them and uh, I can tell you right now It's gonna be very interesting and uh, we're gonna need and what I'm trying to do is prepare to get a mech out So that I can try to uh, stop some of them The one thing I have a, a little bit of a worry about with the yellow faction is the yellow faction is really ripping up the charts here on the power track as well uh, So that's also scary. So we might want to well, we'll have to see how things pan out, but there's uh you know, the distance is obviously a factor for us as well. We can we can use tunnels to our advantage. So there's these red spaces all along the board and you can go in one tunnel and pop out the other side. The Automa cannot use tunnels and has to actually make their way to you. And the way they balance that is because of the fact that the Automa can teleport through their units to move quickly. That's kind of their way of moving quickly around the board. Whereas for us, we have to use tunnels. So if we do want to kind of jump across the board and cause some havoc over on this side. We're going to have to go through a tunnel to do that or just take the really, really long route of going straight across. You know what I'd love to hear from you guys is kind of what you think I should do next. I position myself like this. You can see the resources my guys are sitting on. We've got an encounter token nearby that we can go after. We know our objective. The one that's the, probably the best to go for is to try to control five different uh, hexes around a local lake, basically, or a lake that we are kind of near. So if we can do that, that's also a plus. There's many other things we could do. We could focus on trying to build a mech next. We are within range here of moving workers into the uh, steel area here and harvesting for some steel. Um, again, now we have a much stronger movement for the future, although I can't move next turn because my that's what I chose last. But in the future when I move, I can move three units uh, one space each, which really will allow me to start moving workers around and maybe get my character up closer to these encounters. And encounters can have really nice stuff in them. Might be something worth doing. We might get some really cheap steel or something like that. 
So there's a couple things that I want to just correct, and it's actually just one major thing. I totally missed this when I was going through the Automa's movement, and we definitely had the movement to spend. Whenever there's a actual meeple here for a worker and you get a move uh, worker action, you can actually move it to the same location as your character. The only stipulation is that uh, you can't move it to another hex that already has a worker. Uh, so basically this guy would have and could have moved to this location right here. So I'm just going to correct that right now after the fact. So there's those of you that have been watching the playthrough at this point might have been thinking, might have been co uh, even commenting, uh, it was that worker supposed to move out to this location? Yes, it was. Um, so this would have been a valid uh, location. Uh, it would have had two adjacent uh, workers around it, so this would have been it, and we can still can't cross rivers. So this really isn't a game-breaking uh, miss on my part, but it is kind of a silly one, so I thought I'd mention it here. And wouldn't you know it, because I did it here with the Yellow Faction, the exact same thing presents itself over here. Again, we had multiple times where the uh, move uh, worker uh, action came along, and I could have easily moved one of these workers to this location. It wouldn't have changed any of the gameplay to this point, but it definitely matters, because these are all... Uh, well, the whole thing is about making this as accurate as possible. So that was just a miss on my part, but now everything has been corrected in terms of moving of the workers. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, keep on rolling solo. <laughs>